Hi, I'm Renelle Golden, and you're listening to the Movie Making Podcast. This episode is brought to you by Atlas VPN. Did you know we carry around one of the most vulnerable computers in our pocket? Our cell phones store our bank info, passwords, and other personal data. That's why you need a good VPN to protect you wherever you are. Atlas VPN offers next-generation encryption to hide your virtual location on your phone, making it easy to protect you no matter where you are. Podcast listeners can take advantage of Atlas VPN's biggest sale of the year. Get 86% off two years of Atlas VPN, plus a free additional six months. Head on over to get.atlasvpn.com forward slash movie making pod. That's get.atlasvpn.com slash movie making pod. With Atlas VPN, you can rest assured your information will always stay private and secure. Today we're here with John Capone, writer, producer, and director. How are you doing today, John? Hello. Hi. Good, good. Good. Thank you so much for having me on, Renelle. I, I am thrilled to have you on. You and I have something in common I thought was really funny, although, you know, that might give away my goofiness, but we have the same birthday. Oh, we do. Not oh the same God. year, thank God. But <laughs> Right, different years, same day, March same day, 12th, a good, March a good Pisces. Yep, exactly. <laughs> so it, it explains your creativeness. So I wanted to talk to you about your journey becoming a filmmaker. And it yeah. looks like you are a writer at heart. You, you do a lot of writing. And so let's start with the beginning. How on earth did you become a filmmaker? How did you know you wanted to do this? And what was your journey? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, I think it goes all the way back to when I was six or seven years old. Oh, I grew wow. up with a with a big extended family in upstate New York, about an hour east of Buffalo in a town called Rochester. Okay. And uh, I lived, we call it kind of like the, the Kennedy compound. I, I lived amongst my cousins. My aunts and uncles were right down the street. Oh, wow. And in the summer, you know, I just had this proclivity, had, had a big, expansive imagination, I guess, and would wrangle up my cousins, get, a, a, you know, a Super 8 video camera and, you I know, pull that. them out to the backyard and we would just roam and I would create scenarios and direct my cousins and oh, pretend there was so like cool. al- <laughs> yeah, alien invasions and stuff. And we would just, we would have a lot of fun. It would we feel like those days would go on forever and you know we were exhausted by the end of the day and then i would go and play back the super 8 films and and just uh get really wow. inspired and, you know i think it's just over time like anything else you do it enough and you get hooked and you everyone develop knew passion it. for it yeah i bet everyone knew what you were going to be when you grew up very much so it was between that and baseball i was a big baseball guy too but when oh, it wow. came to the end of high school i kind of had to make that decision there was like d2 d d3 baseball colleges scouting me and i had to tell my my varsity baseball coach i'm like i think oh, i'm gonna wow. go with film i just like feel like there's more of a passion and maybe a career here so uh, yeah. yeah, it was, it was tough, but always, yeah. From the beginning, I think obviously like the play like nature of, of actually doing it, which I think is the best way to learn about film and being a filmmaker is to just do it right. Just jump Very in. Immersive. Um, yeah, definitely. And then just loving, you know, when I was young, 12 or 13, probably a little too young, watch taxi driver and the <laughs> aviator Martin Scorsese movies and oh, just wow. fell in love with his filmmaking. Something different, something special about his filmmaking. And yeah, I just wanted to pursue that. I went to Loyola Marymount University, which has a great film school. I think it was named within the top 10 by, oh, wow. I think it was USA Today or Hollywood Reporter recently. Yeah, so um, just continued the journey there and continued to get inspired. So what was your like very first film that you made? Oh, um, that you made. I guess it. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I guess like if you talk about those early years of being a 10 year old uh, running around the backyard. Oh, um, it, <laughs> I yeah, should it was say like out of a, college, right? <laughs> yeah, out of college. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That, that's a little bit of clarity on that question because there's different phases of, <laughs> of my young filmmaking career. So actually, I, I did my senior thesis at LMU. It was an old detective noir film, uh, like an homage to the 1940s, 
with a little bit, I tried to like update the storytelling technique in a more of like a true detective sort of like split fractured timeline narrative. Oh, um, neat. So okay. a little bit of, yeah, experimentation there. And then on a college, I did another short film called Hide Your Fires, which is a sci-fi. It's about VR, the world of like a tech startup, virtual oh, reality, cool. kind of a dystopian sci-fi. So it was cool to kind of play in different genres. And that's something I really like to do as I approach the next project is to figure out, OK, what story do I want to tell? And then what world does it live in? And, you know, how can I bring genre in in an interesting way right. um, to, to help tell that story? Um, and then it came to Neon Bleed in the past couple of years. I wrote and directed and my my wife helped me produce our debut feature called Neon Bleed, which is about right. a pop star in the music industry. I so, yeah, a few that. short films after school. And then that led up to this debut feature. I love that. And I, I really love that you two kind of did that as a team. That's that's really cool. Is your wife a filmmaker, too, then? She is. Yeah, she's so she's a producer and an actress as well. She has a supporting role in Neon Bleed. I call it the pivotal role, the the keystone role in the film. She's kind of like the linchpin. Her character is the linchpin who's really helping the main character kind of progress along his character arc. Oh, wow. And, wow. and it's kind of like this, like, well, she's definitely a femme fatale hit woman in it. But she's also like this, like pseudo mother, like mother he didn't have. Um, oh, and cool. and helps kind of, yeah, kind of pull him along the hero's journey. So she plays a really interesting role. But yeah, so we met at an acting program in Los Angeles called Baron Brown Studio, and they specialize in the Meisner technique. And that's kind of when I, so that was like right after I graduated from film school and uh, was exploring, you know, what do I really want to do? Do I want to act? Do I want to direct? I didn't really know coming out of film school. You kind of and, liked it all or tried it all? Yeah, I just wanted to dip my toe in different departments, I guess, of the filmmaking process. And actually through Baron Brown, this Meisner program, it actually made me, oddly enough, really want to write more and kind of unlocked like my creative uh, okay. writer voice in so an interesting way. So that. What's when, that? when did you like discover your ability to write? Because you, you've written a lot of stuff. Yeah, yeah. I like I said, I think I I didn't really know what my creative voice was. I wasn't really in touch with that in college. It was really after college when I took this Meisner technique, which is really about dramaturgy. You know, Sanford Meisner created this technique for actors that really helped them become in tune with their role in so the storytelling great. process. Yeah, yeah. I love working with actors trained in that particular technique, they just oh, absolutely. Yeah, there's just something about it. And you can tell you have all the different type of techniques out there, but that one is one of the best. So for sure, for sure. It really gets actors grounded in the world of the story. You know, they, they call it like the shared circumstance. You're creating a circumstance around this exercise that you're doing with another actor. So you have to be really creative and light on your feet when you're doing simple exercises in this first year program. And that's where I met my future wife. You know, we met. It was so funny. I'm from Rochester, like I said. She's actually from Buffalo. Oh, and we met in so this cool. acting class in Los Angeles. Yeah. Yeah. We didn't know for like two months that we what were. We grew world. up like an hour apart. Yeah. Wow. Such a small world. It, it was meant to be. And then she at the time had, she did a lot of dancing in, in Vegas. She was in a Michael Jackson live show. And she that's had a BA neat. in dance from the Ohio State University. And then. Did a stint in Vegas for a few years, loved her da the, the dancing um, um, career she had there, but wanted to transition more into acting. So started driving out, taking acting classes in L.A. And that's where we met. And I was, you know, gearing up for this second short that I mentioned, Hide Your Fires. And she yeah. was like, if I could help out in any way, you know, I'd love to just be on set, help assist you in any way. And I was like, you know what? I think I might have a role for you. And I originally cast her as this one role. And then my producing partner was like, wait, no, you got to be this other role. <laughs> and so we found a role for her, obviously. And she helped produce that as well. And that was kind of the the beginning of a, a beautiful partnership, as they say. I love that. I love that. <laughs> yeah. And Okay, so the concept for Neon Bleed, how did you come up with that? Yeah, so this was, I think, right before COVID hit, Justin Bieber released a documentary that was very intimate and candid about his experience, experiencing burnout from his, Oh wow! you know, obviously by that point, it was, it was 2017 and he had gone on 
almost 10 years, right. Since becoming like this golden child singer, superstar. Right. Right. And so just the stress and the pressure of the people around him and the insane amount of hours he was putting in really like the dopamine burnout that he was experiencing just on like a physiological level, you know, he explained he had to just stop, you know, and, Uh, and with that, the money-making machine stuff too. Right. So it was just, it was just really interesting. It got my, my gears turning on how these pop stars, these superstars who are so renowned and known globally for, you know, their brand really, when it gets too much, it's too invasive on a, on a personal level. They lose touch with their creative voice. They lose touch with their, their purpose and their drive. And they just say, I can't do this anymore. And they walk away. And what those power structures and money making systems, you know, how they respond to that decision. So that was kind of, you know, the interesting, yeah, idea that, that, that piqued my interest. And then I, I started to, you know, watch a ton of industry movies. I knew I would be dealing with the music industry. I watched, you know, obviously a star is born was a big influence, the Bradley Cooper, Lady Gaga version. Yeah. um, And how, Bradley Cooper, you know, produced and sang his own music, right? Which is and amazing. And so that was something. Yeah, yeah, it was amazing. And it's something we wanted to do if we could pull it off. And, and we ended up writing four original songs. And our lead actor who played the pop star sang those songs, oh, blended wow. his vocals for those songs. Yeah, so we tried to go as authentic as possible to really make you believe as you were watching this film that this guy, you know, was the pop star. He was the guy. He was like a Justin Bieber, Sean Mendez or Harry Styles type personality. Yeah. Um so yeah, it was it was really interesting to kind of delve into that world. I also like films like Sweet Smell of Success, Old Noir as I mentioned, kind of had that thread of noir interest me in in college and you know there's there's a lot of sort of like undercurrent themes in the film about you know, power structures and, you know, big media tycoons who really call the shots and they have, yeah. you know, their, their minions the at different levels. Yeah. And you kind of get that definitely, vibe. Um, it, it's captivating. It's interesting because you do, you see that, that burnout, the, you want to be somewhere else. You want to be doing something else or the, it was interesting. And um, it, it looks like a, a really good movie. Thank What's you. happening? Is it in distribution or? What yep. We so we now? so we are with a distribution company. They're a small boutique company out of Los Angeles called Porter Craig, and they've been great. They're very personal, very personal touch, uh, working with their filmmakers and kind of tailoring the the release schedule that helps the film the best. Obviously, right now with streaming, it can be kind of the wild west, and you don't really know how to optimize, you yeah, know, revenue so for, many for your film. Yeah. yeah, and they've been very communicative and, and helpful with us. So we're on Vudu, we're on Tubi, Spectrum TV, and I think one other platform right now. But oh, we're supposed awesome. to roll out onto Amazon Prime and Apple TV in the next couple weeks or months here. So Just that's being exciting on, too. On those big uh, AVOD channels or streamers, whatever you call them, the AVOD yeah. stuff up front, that's, that's a great thing to start with. That's you very yeah no it was it very was great. I think we I released a voodoo first and then um once they were able to land the deal with Tubi we were like great you know that kind of it feels yeah. really good to be on one of those you know more well known well used platforms that that people really interact with and yeah we've gotten some good responses from the film just from you know people we don't even know that have enjoyed it and it's exciting. You know, Awesome. Yeah, yeah, it's a great. It's been a great response thus far. Wow, and that just came out this year too, right? It did. So it, it released on Vudu at the end of January, and then Tubi, I think, at the end of or beginning of May, I believe. Okay. So yeah, it's been sort of a steady rollout, and it's it's been nice because we get to kind of promote the film over more of a longer horizon, and it's just so fun. You know, it, it feels like yeah. a world that people can really sink their teeth into with the pop star and, and obviously the music it's fun to we put the music on spotify and everything so oh i love that that's awesome yeah that's- yeah it's been a fun journey thus far see you you filmed this during the pandemic it was june the end of june 2021 yeah, uh, into the okay. beginning of July. So yeah, I mean, I think the Delta variant was kind of peaking at that point. And uh, 
it's just so interesting trying to kind of grapple with that. But honestly, I wouldn't have Neon Bleed if we, if I didn't have the pandemic because it was kind of at the beginning of COVID when I really kind of buckled down and wanted to write a, a very lean and mean, you know, $250,000 film that we feel like we could go out raise the finance and produce it ourselves. Because obviously with COVID, when that hit, you know, we had scripts out to different people that we were trying to set up at a production company or, you know, gain bigger financing for. And all that just fell apart, right? At the beginning of COVID. So I was like, let's just try to do something in-house that we can control the parameters, you know, relatively speaking. And by the time June, 2021 came along, we felt there was an opening to do it, you know? So that's, we were, yeah, no one got COVID on our set, thankfully. You know, <laughs> we would have shut down the production. Too, right? We were yeah. in the same thing because right when COVID hit, um, my son is my writing partner and my production company nice. partner. He's 22. And we were doing our first feature and it was February of 2020. We don't know COVID's looming, yeah. right? And we finished that. We wrap up the first part of the proof of concept that we were doing to promo it, basically trailers and, you know, and by the end of March, we're locked down and our investors like, sorry, guys, I just can't. We don't know what's going to happen. And we were standing there like going, what now? And we couldn't proceed on that one because there were so many people and so much money wrapped up in it and stuff during the pandemic. And it really, at first was discouraging, but we did end up, we were like, okay, what are our options? And we, we actually wrote a feature film in nine days, but first we picked the location in our neighborhood so we wouldn't have to travel. And we filmed Very a feature cool. film at the bowling alley during That's 2020, awesome. the end of 2020, because we didn't want to end the year, our first year in business, not making anything. <laughs> so... Right. So it sounds like you had the same kind of same idea, same thought processes, yeah. you know, and I think I think it for those crucible times of like adversity and obstacle. Obviously, this was such a huge sort of global influence in that case, but it, yeah. it really does force you to think about creative ways to get something done. Get yeah. a, a story out there. Yeah, it, it helped me be very focused, even in the writing phase, like you mentioned of, you know, writing your story around one location. Yes. Similar thing. It's like, you know, very few locations, a contained feeling film and really rely on the actors. You know, Neon Bleed, we have an, a great ensemble of, of character actors and a lot of interesting personalities, as you can yeah, maybe I guess saw. from the, the trailer. Yeah. Yeah. So, it um, yeah. It informed the creative process. So, yeah. You know, and it's something to like just really feel like you accomplished something because. It could have been that you let it be that the odds were against you, but look what you did. You climbed that mountain when other people didn't. They laid down and waited for it to be over or felt, you know, depressed or whatever. And you were more driven. And I admire that. Yeah, that was definitely in our minds, too. It's like, okay, people are going to dial back. They're going to slow down. They're going to pull back. This is an opportunity for us to to seize the day. And, you know, we knew we needed to make a debut feature that could give us, you know, that calling card, the credibility for our next feature, which we're going into finance on now. And it just felt like a good opportunity. It's awesome. Yeah. So what's what's coming up next? So next, I have a feature script that I wrote before the whole neon bleed process. So this I wrote at the end of 2019, and it's it's very much a new. I pitch it as like a New England family drama, like a, a Manchester by the Sea oh, or Ordinary nice. People. If you remember that film from the yeah. early 80s, very restrained, uh, very simple. Uh, it follows a protagonist who's a high school English teacher who had given up a dream on being a writer and his former student of his comes into town and they meet by happenstance, they catch up and kind of inspires him to pursue sort of reawaken this, this abandoned dream of being a writer amidst family turmoil. He has a sister who is dealing with drug abuse and, you know, his parents' family tensions are running high at the time. So it it really is a story about an individual sort of rediscovering his own purpose in life, a a creative calling that he put by the wayside to, you know, support his family, obviously, and help his community. So it's, yeah, very simple themes, very stripped down. Like I said, Manchester by the Sea is is probably a good comparable to describe it. Nice. Very nice. Wow. That, that's kind of exciting too, then. If you had to share like advice for upcoming filmmakers, what what would you tell them? Um, I would tell them watch a lot of movies, uh, number one, and, and really pay attention to the types of movies you're interested in. And that could be anything. It could be an Avengers blockbuster 
blockbuster, a Martin Scorsese film or some sort of a obscure European film. And yeah, just never stop really closing yourself off to influences. And that can extend even beyond movies. It could be, you know, novels that you really like, you know, storytelling of any kind. Um, you never know where, you, where you're going to be inspired from. And then on the same token, you know, listening to your gut in terms of what department you might want to specialize in, because that's that's something I think like young filmmakers can kind of get lost in the totality yeah. of, of filmmaking and say like, right out of the gate. Oh, I really want to direct. And I think it's important. You know, I had, this is where I think film school was great. I don't think you necessarily need to go to film school, but I think it, it can be a great opportunity to really go to a good film school where you can get on set, right. And learn what the different departments do in this sort of, you know, film is a very complex thing. It's a very multi-layered organism. Yes, and you have to understand that there's people who specialize in very specific things and they're all happening at once in this rhythm and this dance for, for you to just get through your day, you know? So yeah. the sooner you can figure out exactly what you want to do while still sort of maintaining this broad education in, you know, the history of film, I think that's, you know, that's the best thing you can do and not feel like there's any one path that, you, you know, oh, I need to make films exactly like Scor Martin Scorsese, exactly when he made those types of films. No, you're on your yeah. own journey. You know, don't put the pressure on yourself to, yeah. you know, to make a $50 yeah. million dollar film when you're 22 years old. And right. the other thing is, it's just it's all life you know being an artist is is being a human being and you know using the situations you go through on a personal basis to help fuel your creative storytelling because that's going to be the most sort of truthful writing or directing you'll ever do is is the stuff that's most personal to you right right did you always want to be a director because you did direct your feature is this something you're going to yeah. continue doing or um, I think so. I right now I I always look at stuff that I do in a creative sense. I need to have like a hunger there to do it. And right, right. now I'm I'm definitely hungry to direct. <laughs> um, I love it. I, yeah. I just am really interested in like the frame and stories you can tell on right. frame uh, within a frame, you know, a moving picture and the cut, you know, from right. from one composition to another that conveys sort of a third idea that exists outside of those two frames is very interesting and and just, I think a cool extension, like I, I love just fiction and literature, right. but I think, you know, cinema is such an interesting extension of literature that you can bring in the image and color and performance and music and sound design to really enhance sort of a literary experience. So oh, what excites me about directing it. is, yeah, as, as kind of, you know, I, I think people shy away from the word control, but it, it's really like being a conductor in, in an orchestra. You know, a great director knows how to play certain instruments at certain times to create an overall experience. Great analogy. That's a really good one. You have done both on camera and off. Do you have a preference or do you enjoy both equally? Yeah, I, I do like acting. I think it's incredibly freeing. You know, the nice thing about acting is that you can really only think about one thing and that's the moment you're in, right? right. Um, there was a saying in, in Meisner, what are they doing? How do I feel about it? That's kind of that sort of Zen space as an actor that you get in. You can't think about what the cameraman's doing or the or the boom operator or right. the, the production designer present. worrying about furniture. Yeah. Right. You need to be completely locked in and present yeah. in whatever is supposed to be gripping you, dictated by the story. Right. So that could be another actor. It could be a mountain lion that walks into the room. You know, <laughs> we like watching performance because the the actor is completely dialed in and tuned into the moment. And yeah. so that could be really freeing because you're just sort of surrendering to the moment, you know? Right. So I really like that. I guess it's like more of like a therapeutic exercise. I, I really enjoyed acting and it did inform a lot. Like I, like I mentioned about my writing and directing process, I think I do like directing more just for the reasons I described. I think it's I view it as such a uh, responsibility. You know, you have the such a huge responsibility thing. to craft, yeah, yes. craft a story. And it's something I like challenging myself with, I yeah. guess. I love that. I love that. Well, if people want to find you, John, how can they find you? Yeah, my personal Instagram account is jcaponer. That's J-C-A-P-O-N-E-R. And then my company is La Familia Pictures. We're on Instagram at La Familia Pics. 
and on YouTube as well, La Familia Pictures, we have a YouTube channel where we post our trailer and um, we're also doing these discussions with other filmmakers as well. I don't know if it's a podcast yet, but it's just sort of documenting discussion. So we released to that YouTube channel and our website is LaFamiliaPictures.com. Love that. Love it. Well, I have really enjoyed talking to you today. Is there anything else you wanted to share about any of your upcoming projects or Oh, yeah, I guess I remember we also have an account for the film on Instagram, at Neon Bleed as well. At Neon Bleed. Great. <laughs> Get that song. one in there. Yeah. I, I hope it has a wonderful success. It just, it looks awesome. So, okay, well, I would like to do our final few minutes and do our five for five questions whenever you're ready. Sounds good. Let's go. Okay, here we go. All right. Question number one, what is your favorite food? Oh, I mean, I really like a nice ribeye steak, but I am Italian, so uh, <laughs> a bowl of grandma's homemade noodles and pasta sauce, I'm going to have to go with that one. <laughs> oh, I love that. That's cool. Okay. All right. Number two, what is something non-film related that inspires you or motivates you in life? That's another good question, too. I will go with this because this was a recent event. My wife and I just welcomed our first child. He's a baby boy, Luca. His name's Luca Capone. Oh, what a and great name. Yeah. Oh, had to go with a good Italian name. Yes. Um, but yeah, he's yes. just a, a huge source of inspiration right now. Just I, I my parents told me this and everyone tells you this. You just don't know the type of love that you could have for another human being until a baby comes in. You You're a really baby. Don't. And uh, it's very motivating and, and inspiring uh, creatively you and just personally. Too, right. <laughs> totally. Has to. Has to get, yep, you, gotta get you out of bed a little more than you might want to. But it's so worth right. it. I love that. So, okay, next question. What is one thing you have always dreamed of doing, uh, but you haven't done yet that's not film related? Oh, that's a really, really good one. Um, <laughs> this is just on the top of my mind. I don't know if it's on my top of my bucket list, but on the top of my mind, I would really like to, I thought about doing this with, with Luca and if we have more kids, doing like a month to two month long trip through the East Coast of revolutionary war and civil war battlefields to try to just get like a huge oh that's cool historical scope of that i just that i've been be really to some cool. of them oh. yeah i've been to like gettysburg and i've been to washington dc but i would just like to do sort of like the the trip to end all trips on that on that yeah. subject matter yeah. i just think history is so interesting especially if your kids are like you know five six years old old enough to like right. start explaining what you're seeing and Give them exactly, that yeah. love of history. I love that. That's a cool answer. All right. Back to our Thank movie you. questions. Okay. What is your favorite song to sing the top of your lungs when you drive in the car? Ooh, uh, <laughs> probably a Dean Martin song. Um, I love it. Valare. We've been singing Valare oh. recently with, with Luca during fast time. So, oh. and we've had it on in the car as well to, to soothe him. So that's our, that's our most oh recent. God, I love that. I was not that yeah. clever with my kids. It was ABC. <laughs> <laughs> hey, those are good too. Sometimes you need a nice nursery rhyme. Yeah. 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 I love it. Okay. Last question. Um, and this one's usually hard for us filmmakers, but what is your favorite movie? Oh, yeah, that is. I've got like 10, 10 of them. Um, I, you know, oh, yeah, this is a really tough one. I, I mean, I will say it's probably the one that I'll, I'll just say the one that got me into filmmaking, which was Martin Scorsese's The Aviator. I, I It was the first Scorsese film that I saw on the big screen. And oh, wow. obviously Leonardo DiCaprio's performance, but the type of editing, That's it was the first film where I noticed there was something extra going on in the editing it wasn't just to document the story or make you um, you know feel the story it was more psychological it was more uh from howard hughes's pov some of the editing and the, and the shot composition so that's neat. um okay. just yeah for what that film gave me i'll say that's my favorite <laughs> that is really a good one too wow okay well you have been awesome to talk to you and i i hope you have great success with neon bleed and i can't wait to see your next one Come back anytime. Thank you, Rennell. Thank you so much for having me. It was a pleasure talking to you too. Thank you. Have a great day. Bye-bye. You too. Take care. Movie Making with Rennell Golden is brought to you by Samira Entertainment. 
supporting indie films and the filmmakers who create them. Stop by their website to learn more, www.samiraentertainment.com. That's www.samiraentertainment.com. You've been listening to Movie Making with Rennell Golden. Be sure to come back for our next episode where we bring you the people who make movies you love. Got a topic about filmmaking you want to hear on our podcast? Send us an email at moviemakingpodcast at gmail.com. Thanks for listening.